Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the April Lunch and Learn for the Warren County Historical Society's Harmon Museum. I'm John Zimkus, the Education Director and Historian, and uh, we're so happy that you're with us today. Uh, this, uh, this year has been a great year for Lunch and Learns. Our crowds are coming back and we're very, very pleased about that. There's a number of activities going on I think you should know about today. Um, on Friday, the, April 21st, we're going to have a new art display in the Gary Samuel Dinger Art Gallery. And it's going to be Suzanne Mann, and it's going to be called Blooms. It'll begin on Friday the 21st and run through May. Uh, there will be a, um, a free open house on Friday the 21st. 5.30 for those who are members, but 6.30 for those who are non-members can go, go through and get some hors d'oeuvres and, uh, and see the great display of Su Susan's artwork. The following day, I'll be giving a lecture here, although I will be the guest speaker for the Warren County Genealogical Society. But they're going to be meeting here and I'll be discussing uh, Lebanon African Union School and Professor S.R. Bailey. It'll be free, uh, it's at 1.30 in the afternoon. It's about the, uh, the quote, colored school in Lebanon, uh, beginning in 1861, and an African-American teacher, uh, a college graduate, uh, who actually was born a slave um, in um, Alabama and went, came north during the Civil War and his fascinating story. That'll be on the um, Friday, the uh, Saturday, the uh, 22nd at 1.30. On Thursday, April 27th, we're gonna have our Shakespeare tea, which hopefully you'll come and join us. Uh, that'll be at one o'clock, there'll be readings and it'll be in the uh, Village Green. And check our website for cost and uh, more exact information on that. The first Saturday in May, which is gonna be the sixth, in June, which is going to be the third, and in July, which is gonna be the first, the Beetle Cabin, our 1895 cabin, uh, will be open to the public, it'll be free, and from uh, 11 to one, and we're gonna have a, a weaving and spinning uh, exhibit uh, going on um, in May. Uh, our director, Michael Coyne, and myself will be in Tall Tales and Pioneer Stories uh, on uh, June 3rd, and then we'll have uh, Pioneer Crafts on July 1st. And as I mentioned, uh, that'll be free from uh, 11 to 1. On Thursday, May 11th, we're going to have music at the museum, and we're going to have classical pianist. Uh, Daniel Sachs will be here. It's a Thursday night at 7.30. The prices are $15 for adults, uh, $10 for seniors, and $5 for students. And that'll be at 7 o'clock here in the conference center. We're going to have our flea market on June 2nd and 3rd, Friday and Saturday here, which will be free. And then something to consider on... Um, May 26th, there will be a tour of the Lebanon Pioneer Cemetery, which is actually the Baptist Cemetery and the Methodist Cemetery, all in the same city block, uh, both uh, about 120 years old. And I'll be conducting the tour, but we will visit a few of the people who are buried there, and um, we will have uh, people portraying them and telling them their story they will tell us our story. So there's a lot of interesting things uh, taking place in the museum and involving the historical society. As far as lunch and learns go, uh, our director, Michael Coyne, will be giving our lecture uh, here on May 17th. What's new with the museum? We have, we're getting a constant barrage of new items, especially in the folk art genre. Uh, and um, we also have a lot of things we have that we didn't know we have. So it's sort of new to us. Uh, so we're uncovering things and we're having donations. And that'll be a pretty good and interesting uh, 
presentation for our May Lunch and Learn. On June 21st, our luncheon and speaker will be Suzanne Anderson Taylor. She's a teacher at Lebanon High School, and uh, she'll be talking about what happened at Prince uh, King Charles coronation. She does this in her class, and she goes to the great detail as to the entire ceremony and the, the items involved with that, and I think you'll find that very interesting. On July 19th, our speaker will be Tom Calarco, who will be talking about Orson Murray, uh, an abolitionist, a free thinker, and a hippie from about 130 years too early. Uh, he really was a fascinating gentleman, uh, born in Vermont, uh, moved to Warren County, lived near Foster, um, and um, Quite a fascinating uh, character. If you, by the way, it's free to go through the museum today because you are our guest here. Uh, if you go to the Underground Railroad uh, display on the lower level, you'll see a picture of him. Uh, he either looks like uh, Rip Van Winkle after he just woke up after 20 years or a drunken Santa Claus. So you, you can take a look at that picture of him and decide which one he is. Um, then in August, we're going to have Kim Valarva, and she will be talking about Civil War women uh, forging a path, uh, and about how women felt the need to, uh, to get involved and then began to make history themselves. And that'll be on August 16th. So we have quite a few uh, interesting things taking place at the Harmon Museum. Uh, um, we are so happy that you're with us today, and hopefully you will come join us for some of the other activities we have. By the way, the, what you are dining on right now, of course, is uh, uh, asparagus sautéed in garlic and onions, roasted potatoes, Yukon gold potatoes, roasted in herbs, and chicken uh, chardonnay, uh, the creamy chardonnay and mushroom sauce and strawberry shortcake will be your dessert. So enjoy your meal, and in a half hour or so, I will introduce our speaker. Uh, if I have your attention, please. Once in a while, they do let me out of the office. So um, I'm Michael Coyan, I'm the director, and uh, I have something that I think is a very special thing, but it's to a very special individual. Um, we often, see people who throw themselves into their work, driven not by monetary gain or big retirement, but by the love of what they're doing. We've had a fortunate run of people in the city of Lebanon and Warren County from its very founding to the current day. And I think of whether they are politicians like Thomas Corwin, many of you who know that name, and his illustrious career, or someone like Doris Corson, who gave herself so unselfishly to establish the Lebanon Council of Garden Clubs. And there are people like that in all of the history, art, and culture of our county. But today, we would like to honor a fellow who has given service above and beyond. So I would like, on behalf of the board and the membership of the Warren County Historical Society, to present the first Thomas Corwin Award for his distinguished service in history, art, and culture in Warren County and Southwest Ohio to Mr. Jack Blosser. You got it. You got it. Uh, thank you very much. And that includes a lifetime membership, so we expect you to be around for a while. Wow. Thank okay? you so much. Thank you. Unexpected. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Well, you've met him briefly, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, Jack has, has two degrees, graduated from Defiance College with a degree in history and museology. Is that the correct pronunciation? Uh, and then he went to UC and he got a degree in anthropology, specialty in the Hopewell culture. No doubt a specialty in the Hopewell culture as you were about to see. Uh, 
For 32 years, he has been the site manager of Fort Ancient. He was a site manager. Um, after that, he did serve as the executive director of the Spring Road Chamber, active in our community of Southwest Ohio, chairman of the board of the YMCA Camp Kern, program coordinator for the Boy Scouts of America for three decades, a uh, member of the Project Excellence of Warren County Board, and uh, for a while, a trustee at large for the Ohio Local History Alliance. He is active in our community. He is preserving the history of our community. And I am thrilled to introduce you today, our speaker, Jack Blossom. Can you cheer me up, sir? Nope? Okay. Let's see if I can bring this up just a little bit. Here, you want to help me? Sure. Is that better? Hello. Excellent. Well, first off, I have to say thank you very much to the Warren County History Center. I had no idea that they were doing this for me today, obviously. But uh, I always tell people that I'm happier in a possum in a garbage can to talk to an audience whose height is greater than three foot two. So, but uh, yeah, I'm a, an archaeologist by training. And I've st I, did, I started to do programs when I was 17, 16 years old. Public speaking is my passion. And the program I'm going to present with you folks today, I, I like to call it prehistory versus history. And the program will be divided into two segments. Number one, prehistoric culture. Area two, historic. So how many historians do we have in here? Minus John. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be asking questions that's open to the public. I like class participation. If nobody raises their hand, I'll pick on somebody. So especially the ones that look down. Uh, I, I do that a lot. All right, uh, when, when do you think history, historic period started in the Ohio area? Thousands of years ago. Well, nope, nope. History is written record. So when the first Europeans came to the area, and again, the first Europeans, it's down, we, we really don't know the very first time but was it in the, like the early 1700s, late 1600s, John? He isn't even listening. John. <laughs> Historic period in this area is around late 16, early 1700s? Yes. Okay, there we go. So last night when you went to bed, you were prehistoric peoples. And you used things provided by Mother Nature. And I love to play the guessing game with uh, children, and I'm sure that you folks will like this as well. There were three big game animals in the Ohio area at around, let's say, sa -da 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 -da, 1500 AD. What three big game animals were in Ohio? Can you name me one? Deer, okay, that's two. Oh, and you said, you said what? Bears, one. Mary, bison, uh, um, bison, bison is the number one incorrect answer. The bison in Ohio is very late period in time. And there were the woodland bison, which are smaller, and they don't go in groups of hundreds or thousands. But uh, I recall reading a, a journal from General Anthony Wayne in 1791, 92, is that... Um, in northern Ohio, at the All Glaze and Maumee Confluence, they had wild, wild cattle. And it was the woodland bison. So, but they were wiped out pretty quickly uh, in the Ohio area after that. So there's one more big game. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you got it. Very few people guess the elk. They always say moose. So moose wasn't in the Ohio area at that point in time. And so those were the big game, the meat hunting also the clothing. And we'll talk a little bit about the clothing in a bit. The crow is the messenger. 
So whenever I get a message, and I forgot to shut this down. So <laughs> I like to have fun. All right, we're going to talk now about the animals that are in Ohio, and there is one that was not in Ohio at that point in time. So we're going to play the guessing game. We'll do a somewhat easy one first. What is this one? Mink, good. Throw that under there. This one? Oh, pardon me? Beaver? Nope, not a beaver, not a muskrat. Ooh, woodchuck. A, yeah. You can always tell when I'm doing programs to the little ones, if they get the groundhog, they're country. They're country. Oh, the groundhog hide actually was so, uh, so dense and thick that the Native Americans would use that hide for a water drum, a small water drum. Uh, this guy? Fox. What type of fox? Don't say dead fox. <laughs> Gray fox. There you go. And then we have his cousin, the red fox. Now, by the way, people are always going to ask, and they always do, did you kill it? Said, when I was a kid, I would find stuff dead along the road in the winter time, And so then I would clean them out and send it away to be tanned. If indeed, though, it was edible, yes, we ate it. So... Uh, this guy I didn't eat. <laughs> Again, when I would do programs with children, we'd play the guessing game. And I would have two skunks. And I would, said, I'm not even going to look at this one. And then I say, what is this? And they say, skunk. I said, what? Skunk. Ah, ah. And I toss it into them. <laughs> Thanks for being a good sport. This guy. Everybody knows him. This small critter. A muskrat, excellent, a muskrat. A coyote. This animal was not here. This animal came down from uh, Michigan and they started to come around uh, within the 1950s and 60s. But um, in 1865, the coyote was only known west of the Mississippi. Today, it is in every state in every county in the United States. It's the only animal that has increased its population because other than people, not many people, not many animals are going to be able to kill this thing. So, oh, by the way, this thing was 55 pounds and uh, some people thought it was a mixture between the Michigan, Ki uh, Michigan wolf and the coyote. All right, so now I'm going to go back here. And by the way, um, before you leave, all of these things you can pick up, touch, feel, doesn't matter. And then with the kids, with this bear, I used to have them put this over their head. And then put their hands inside here and have the teacher take pictures of them. That was fun. So some of the clothing. Now deer clothing was used, uh, but it would it wears a lot faster than what the... Um, elk and bear wood. These are called leggings. And again, you, you put it on your leg, pull it up, and then you, have, you will have like a belt around here and you would wear it. And try explaining, let's see, try explaining the apron to the children. And I will just say, it is meant to cover things that need to be covered. Let's go on. So we have the leggings. And this is a Western designed shirt that I made years ago. And it's kind of like a yoke. It's um, uh, the only thing that identifies it as Western is that it has horse hair. But they would make all types of clothing. They would make bags. This is out of uh, an elk. And if you feel it, you will feel how, how thick and dense it is. And then we also have bags made out of leather. A lot of times the Native Americans would use bags of leather to store their tobacco. And then we also have, I didn't talk about this animal, a beaver. Yes, and we're going to talk a lot about that beaver at the end of the prehistoric period. We have this, what is it? Turkey, turkey fan. Prehistoric air conditioning. That's all it would be. And then we have containers. Typically, there would be a, a cork in there, a corn cob, but this would be a canteen. 
We have gourds for bowls. Sweet grass. Sweet grass baskets. Birch bark baskets. And this birch bark basket was given to a friend of mine when he got married. Well, I've got it now, which means it didn't work out for him. And he said, Jack, don't give this to anybody. It's bad luck. We also have a container. This is tulip poplar bark. Tulip poplar is one of the trees that you can actually take a, a third of the, of the bark away from it, and it won't die. And then it will just heal. Uh, this is called a medicine, a medicine basket. The Native American women would have this. And if you see this at all with the Native American women, they were picking medicines. So it's very distinguishable. Everybody knows what this is? Yep, turtle shell for a container. And then we also have other bowls as well. However, this guy, the pottery, this is a copy. And if I drop it, it breaks. A lady would make well over a hundred of these in their lifetime. Lifetime. Average life expectancy of a man, 30 to 35. Ladies, 28 to 32. There were people that lived to be older, but there was also a 40% child mortality rate. Four out of 10 children never made it past the age of five. So if you drop this, you're out of luck. Now, going on, we're gonna talk a little bit about jewelry. <clears throat> This is a bear claw necklace. The stones, this limestone, it was drilled, and the bear claws. Now, the bear claw has an interesting story. This bear was killed in 1927 by my wife's grandfather when he was on a little vacation called a honeymoon. Hello. And a regular Riverstone pendant. We have a bracelet made of fox teeth. And I made this for my youngest daughter when she was five. She took it to school for a show and tell, and she didn't know what it was. I said, oh, here's a bracelet. Okay, Dad, thanks, I'll wear it. Went to school, come home. She said, Dad, Daddy, what is this thing? I said, honey, it's, it's a bracelet. Yeah, but what are these things on it? I said, honey, those are fox teeth. She went, this is exactly what she did. Ew. And she never wore it again. Jeez. We have abalone with also um, wampum beads. And again, okay, you're saying, where is this from? It's from the Southeast United States. And if you've ever seen Last of the Mohicans or Dances with Wolves, there was a gentleman there that made 80% of the regalia. And he was a, became a friend of mine. And he gifted me this about a month and a half before he passed. So it's an heirloom treasure. Other jewelry. You know what these are? Ear spools. Yeah, it still goes today. In fact, ear spools go back well over 3,000 years. So what they would do is they would puncture something into your ear, like the size of a pencil, let it heal, put in a plug that's a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. And eventually then you'd have a hole in your ear wide enough that you could slide your ear. Oh, we have to put on like oils. Uh, bear grease, deer grease or something, and you would slide it in. And I talked to a lady who had ear spools about this size. It took her almost a year to develop ear holes that big. So I said, well, why do it at all then? But we also have an, um, a pendant, and this pendant shows what they call thunder beings. Thunder beings. When I was a child, I was scared of thunder and lightning. Just like today, people, the children are scared. They were scared prehistorically. But the story behind this, if the historic records are correct, is that everybody has a bad day. And so what they would do is they would wait for the thunder and lightning, and the children would be scared. They said, don't worry, don't worry. Thunder means that grandfather's gonna be sending you a helper. And then the lightning strike comes and a spirit helper is then formed from that lightning strike, and it will come to the people who have illnesses or depression. And so the children wouldn't become scared of thunder and lightning, but they would look forward to it. So that's one way of keeping the children good. 
Uh, let's see, we have what's going on here. Oh, 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 oh. The bow and arrow. This is part of the arrow. When was the bow and arrow invented into Ohio? Anybody? 1,500 years ago. That's a good guess, Jeannie. Good guess. Somebody else? Ma'am, what do you think? Nope, that's wrong. It was after that. That's a, no one has ever said that ever before. That's good. Before that. Ma'am, what do you think? 1601. Okay. Now you're too far along. Bow and arrow in Ohio was developed right around 700 A.D. So for thousands of years prior to that, they used a spear and an atlatl, which I didn't bring, a spear-throwing tool. And the arrow is connected with sinew. Anybody know what sinew is? Sorry? Connective tissue, the tendons. Yeah. And uh, they would use this. And this is where the fun part is with the children. I'll say, you guys, just go ahead and pass this around. Everybody get a chance to touch and feel it. And they do. And the number one incorrect answer was corn husk which looks good, but this is from the back strap of a deer called the silver. If you've ever eaten steak and you got that chewy stuff that you just take out of your mouth and throw away, that's what this is. So you fillet it off and then you dry it and you can see a lot of little lines inside. You break it up to the point where it becomes individual strands and they would use it to sew leather or to sew clothing and uh, also to bind anything that needs to be bound. So that's pretty cool. All right, st uh, stone tools. Neat rocks. What's it used for? Grinding is a good guess. Pardon me? Spark, good guess. Nope. Massages, who said that? <laughs> That is the most unique answer I've ever been given. <laughs> These are hammer stones, plain and simple. And you can see that you have to have an edge for it to work. Now, you could crush bone and stuff with it, but if, you're, if you need an edge, it has to have a corner somewhere. And if indeed it gets used so much that it becomes cylindrical, then they give it to the children, and they use it for like a big marble, and they would have uh, games with these, uh, with these exhausted hammer stones. Flint, it's predictable. I know that if I hit it here, gonna break it there, hit it there, break it there. And if I get good enough at it, I would be able to make those spear and arrow points. And then we have hard stone, which is a celt. Now a celt is an unground tool. Um, grooved axis versus a celt. So, when you use the celt, you have a shaft, and you can wedge this thing in, put in pitch or glue. And I was taught a very unique way of making glue that only has three parts, equal parts. Number one, charcoal. Number two, uh, pine tar or pine pitch. Number three, deer poop. It's because they're herbivores, and everything that they have is fibrous and it acts as a bonding agent. And then you would also wrap rawhide around here. Makes an excellent ax, poor hammer. I saw a video of a man cut down an aspen tree, which is a pretty soft tree. Took him 60 minutes to cut down a nine inch diameter tree. Took a long time. Can anybody say steel chainsaw? <laughs> Let's do that. And then we also have Gardening tools. This is a hoe. A hoe, gardening tool. Can you guys, if I do this, see the, sh the shine on the upper edge over here? That is called um, corn gloss. You have an L-shaped stick, wrap it around, and you s use it repetitively this way. The more you use it, or the faster you use it, it becomes glazed from the friction of that in the soil. What about this? What do you think this was used for? Okay, you could use it for scraping. 
also cutting, but this has a one single purpose. Pardon me? A funnel? Good guess. Another gardening hoe. You have the rod and you push it through. You wrap it with the, with the sinew or rawhide on a long stick. We're on the same subject. What do you think this is? A shoulder blade? What does she say? Clavicle? Oh, she's very professional. This is a shoulder blade. A scapula, okay. It is a garden hoe. Thank you very much. Since we're on, so they used the bear and the elk much more than deer, simply because the deer shoulder blade is thinner and it will break easier. All right, we also have a stone knife with a sheath. A friend of mine made this. He is a survivalist. The hide is a caribou. The stone is an agate from the Alaskan area. The lashing and the pitch. The lashing is nettles. And then he was able to buy, uh, work it to the point where he could um, boil the nettles, dry it, and then take, this, take the, uh, the, the outside fiber off and twine it together. All right, now we have, oh, I'll do some musical instruments. A dance rattle. The uh, native folks, or anybody, would put it around their knees, and as they dance, they can keep beat. Babies also use this. Yeah, a baby has it. Gaga ga, goo goo, everything's good in the world. If it's done playing with it, what does it do? a teething ring. Now let's take a look at the raw material here. What do you think this is? Some of you in the back have a hard time to see it. but It is a hoof. These are deer toenails. Deer toenails. And babies are teething with this. That's kind of cool. A gourd rattle. And today there are people that are called gourd dancers. And it's a very specialized dance and you can only become a gourd dancer by special invitation. Then uh, I had an adopted grandfather who took me to an ICOT, uh, an ICOT powwow and he taught me how to gourd dance. So I was able to go in to an area that is, is exclusively used for warriors that were uh, left with um, uh, honorable discharge and has touched their enemy. That would be called making a coup, touching your enemy without hurting them. I'm not in those service, never was. He was, and he was allowed to invite me in. So this is one of the gourds that we use. Child's tool, toy. Rib bones of a deer. And the a washboard, or putting the spoons to a washboard, same concept. They would score the edges of the deer rib bone. And then the children would be too young to do some of the other instruments, and they would be able to do this to keep the beat with everybody else. All right, now we're going to talk about the boy toys. Conflict has always been there. This is a copy of a spike, a spike war club that was actually found in the 1750s or written about in the 1750s. So I was able to make a copy that's pretty closely resembled to this. So I call it Mr. Spike, a ball-headed war club. The only thing that is historic is the brass beads. And the Ohio Historical Society, or History Connection now, in their museum at Fort Agent, they had uh, Revolutionary War soldiers' uh, burials that had to be excavated to make a road go through it. So as they removed the burials, they did analysis on some of how they died. And there were perfectly circular indentions in the back of the head. So they put one of the war clubs inside one of the indentions and it matched perfectly. All right, last night you're prehistoric folks. You wake up today and there are people that look differently, act differently, talk differently. They're gonna be in your village, they're in your village now. And they want to trade. And they're saying, if you are willing to trade your furs, but we really want the beaver fur, I will give you things, and this is what I tell the fourth graders, you don't have to do this. It's so cool, it'll make you say, ooh, ah, cool, dude. 
and I'd have the children repeat it. By the time I was finished, they were screaming it out. It was, it was a pretty good time. But beaver transforms the native world for the good and the bad. So we're going to talk about the good things. First thing, clothing. Very, uh, very, um, I don't, well, I call it psychedelic. And the Europeans had, had made this neat little thing called a button. This is one size fits most. And then the only thing that wouldn't work necessarily would be the sleeves. So they would use the button then to help bind it so it wouldn't go down beyond your hands. So this is cotton, silk, scarves, bags from wool blankets, and the beadwork. They had some very tiny pony beads that they would uh, use. This is a bag, oh, this is the bag from the 1760s, a copy. This is from the late 1600s, which is a copy. And this bag is one of my favorites. One of the locals here, Connie Heald, had gifted me this for a Christmas present. And it is a copy of an 1820 Shawnee shoulder bag. Things were traded. This, however, is one of the best. Remember I talked about covering things that needed to be covered? This is an apron made out of uh, velvet and cotton and also tiny glass beads. A 17-year-old girl made this. Her 35-year-old mother did this. And so you put it around your waist. Put it around your waist and wear it like this. So now, enter my two children. They were eight, uh, let's see, seven and nine at the time. We had a parent-teacher conference. I come down out of the bedroom wearing this apron. And they said, Dad, what are you doing? Said, come on, we're going to be late. Dad, you're not going to go like that. I said, well, yeah, why not? And then the attitude. Dad, you can't do that. I can never go back to school. I'm going to die. And then they started to cry. All right, they were serious. So I said, okay, I will not wear it. But I will wear it at the next parent-teacher conference. Okay, Dad, that's good. Fine. Next parent-teacher conference, I could not find this anywhere in the house. <laughs> so they told me later, a year later, I found it. And they, I didn't know where, what happened to it. And the girls confessed that they did this to me. So now this is an heirloom just because of what they did. And then they also had gauze. Gauze is a multi-purpose tool. You can use it as a head wrap, a binding. You can rip it and use it to tie anything down. And moccasins. These are deer moccasins. So you can see they're pretty thin, and they've developed um, almost a hole here, but a definite hole. And then the European part would be making the beadwork. A sash. This was gifted to me. Let's see. And it would be worn by dignitaries. And uh, if you put this on for ceremony, they know that you're hot stuff. But kind of cool. And I told you about the leggings. Now, instead of leather, we have cotton. And it is also lined. Let's see here. It is lined, or this is wool, but then it's lined with cotton, so it doesn't itch as much. All right, we're going to get back over here again. Okay, you folks were using all of these baskets in the pottery vessel. Now, and you would make well over 100 of these in your lifetime, now you trade fur for a copper kettle. And this is from the late 1700s, and it's still around. So this is called, it would be called a generational item that you would pass on to your children and your children's children. We also have metal cups. And again, two of my favorites, 
You know, uh, John had mentioned about having um, like a flea market type thing here. Uh, in this room, about eight years ago, uh, there was a, a couple selling pewter. This is from the early 1800s. This is from the late 16, early 1700s. And it's a huge, heavy, heavy pewter plate. Now we talk about some jewelry. Again, bone, stone, shell. Now they have beads. Any idea what these beads are made out of? Yeah, glass beads. And these are called chevron, the bigger ones. These are over 200 to 250 years of age. And they were traded along with pony beads like these. And again, very colorful. Then they also traded for silver and brass jewelry. These are called gorgets. And early on, the only way you would be able to get one of these gorgets, which signifies um, a commanding person or somebody of authority, the only way you would get it is by taking it from them. This was not really traded back and forth for a while. Bracelets made of silver. Can you imagine what these folks were thinking when they finally saw a true fork for the first time? These are later and also a spoon, which I forgot to show you here. Spoon, which is a shoulder blade of a deer and a shell. And then we have, let's see, bone, we have bone awls. And let's see if we have it up here. Oh yeah, then we have metal awls. We can see how it changed the face of the Native American culture. Now, we have these. What is it? A cross. Do not assume that a symbol of religion by one culture is a symbol of religion for another culture. The Jesuit missions were converting, converting Native Americans and giving them these crosses. This was not a religious symbol to the Eastern Woodland. Anybody care to guess what it would represent? Not a telephone pole. A what? A war thing? That's a good guess. It's an insect. A dragonfly, exactly. The dragonfly to the men represented cunningness and skill and speed, because I've never seen a dragonfly get caught by a person. To the ladies, this was a symbol of beauty and elegance. So the Jesuit missions are coming around giving the cross, please accept this cross in the name of my religion. The native folks are saying, hey man, cool dragonfly. Thanks a lot, see you later, bye. And then one of the other big things, stone knives versus metal. And again, this changes everything. You saw the hose over there, now a metal one. Generational items. You take care of them and they'll last for generations. This is from the very early um, 1800s. Stone axe, ta-da, metal axe. And then the tomahawks. This is a pipe tomahawk. You put tobacco in here and you smoke it through here this is actually made from a gun barrel. As you can see the octagon here, it has the symbol of the cross or the dragonfly. And it was used, they, some people call them peace pipes, never existed. A peace pipe, no. But if you get together with a group of people to sign a treaty, a sign of respect is by sharing the pipe with everybody in attendance around the circle. And when I went to schools, I would say, before I go to your school, I'd have to talk to your principal. If the principal is a male, if the principal is a female, my wife would come in and talk. But I would ask for permission to sit down and talk to the children. And then we would share the pipe uh, to seal the event, which is why they call it a peace pipe. Another spike, a war club. Okay, we're doing good. And let's see here. Before I go on, I'm going to share a couple stories and play the flute. Does anybody have any questions about what you see here? Yes, ma'am. 
Good question. How did they know what the Indians wanted? They didn't necessarily know right away. They were taking a guess. Uh, one of the things that I had read is that the Europeans coming in would talk to the Native Americans, and the Native Americans would look at their things. Hey, that's cool. Uh, you want to trade? Back and forth. So eventually, well, at first, the Europeans were giving them trinkets. And the Native Americans thought, hey, this is so good, so cool, we've never seen it. They were underselling the price of the beaver. And then once the price of the beaver was recognized by the Native Americans, then the price went up. And so they would have to trade more, and not the trinkets, but the good stuff. Good question. Yes, John? Good question. Again, why was beaver more valuable than other skins? Beaver in Europe was a sign of what? It was a sign of wealth. Yes, beaver felt lined hats. And also the women in stoles or warmers, this was waterproof. You know, a beaver lives predominantly in the water. And so this would be a water uh, repellent and also a robe for the ladies or a stow on the carriages. But if you had this, because in Europe, this was basically wiped out. And so the primary fur that was used in Europe at the turn of the European contact, uh, goats, uh, cows, and then if they were lucky enough to get a deer or a wild animal, because there wasn't a lot around at that time because the um, domesticated animals took over. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just those, the stupid questions are the ones that aren't asked. That, I have no idea. I have no idea. There is a natural oil in their skin that allowed them, once they got wet underwater, they could glide better or swim faster underwater. But, uh, and then the legs. But I have no idea why this was more water repellent than something else other than maybe because it looked much better too. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Not glass beads. The European or the American Indians would use bone, stone, shell, and even wood for jewelry. So along comes the Europeans with these really cool looking beads, you know, what's gonna win? Those chevron beads or a bear necklace? Chevron beads won. Yeah, I want the shiny ones. Good questions, folks. Yes, sir. Okay, how many of you have ever grown a gourd? Okay, the gourd, when you plant it, it's very fleshy. And if you let it rot, uh, if, it's, if you don't take care of it, before it hardens, it'll just rot away. But if you take it during the fall and put it into a space that is uh, dry and cool, the fleshy part on the inside will dry up. And as it dries up, it becomes much lighter. And then you would be able to take, and I didn't bring a, a natural gourd, but typically they have the top up here, and you would cut part of it off and then ream inside, and then it's so dry that it can be used for storage of that or the canteen with the gourd. They still use the bladders of animals. They still use that, or the stomach of the animal. Good questions. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Finding a lot of dead fox along the side of the road. <laughs> um, now, my family was known as the Northern Beverly Hillbillies. If God made it, we had a chance of eating it. Uh, but we did not eat skunk, weasel, fox, or mink. So uh, in the 1970s, trapping and hunting, it was very big for poor families. And so some of the teeth probably, I've had them for so long, they probably came from hunting them or trapping them and then selling the fur. Yeah. People don't do a lot of that today. Anybody else? 
All right. Now, story time. The flute. Let's make sure. The flute was used, obviously, for music. But if a boy liked a girl, he would never talk to the girl without first talking to the girl's father. I love it. <laughs> and if a boy had a fancy for a lady, one of the calling cards would be making a flute and going out and playing it. However, if you play it like this, not even a fly is going to be attracted. So you would learn to play the music in the woods by yourself. And when you became proficient enough, you would play sweet music around the lady's lodge when you know she's in there. And then the girl knows that he's now playing the flute. And the girl would ask the father, would I have your permission to go out and talk to Jack? If indeed he did like the boy, she was granted. If indeed he did not like the boy, he was still walking around that lodge trying to wait for her to come out. So. So that is the native flute. Well, thank you, thank you. The drum. And let's see here. I didn't necessarily, okay. When I talk to children, I will tell them, I'm gonna, I'll give you the choice of two stories. The snake story or the snake story. Which would you like? So, okay, let's do the snake story. When a child is of age, they would go on a vision quest. They were taken out by the elders far enough away that they can't come back on one day. And they were taken out and sat there and told, the grandfather will give you a vision of what your life will be like. And are you going to be a good hunter, a warrior, a mother, a good, good caretaker? And at the end, and no food and no water for three days. At the end of the third day, this boy who went up to the mountains had never seen a vision or heard a vision from grandfather. And he felt defeated. He was upset. And when he is walking down, he hears a rattle. He looks around, and there is an old rattlesnake. And that rattlesnake is wanting a way down. And he said, boy, can you help me? He said, I'm an old snake. The boy said, but you're a snake, you'll bite me. Well, why would I do that? If I bite you on the mountain, we both die. I'm too old to go down to the valley. Would you pick me up? I was, I was sent to you by your grandfather. I am your vision. That's what he wanted. He wanted the vision. He reluctantly picked up the snake and he put it in his robe. And on the way down, they had to spend the night and then keep going the next day. And the snake said, when you get down to your village, this is what's gonna happen. You're going to see the smoke coming from your lodge. You're going to see your family and friends coming out. And you're going to show them me. And you're gonna have your parents say, put that snake down, it'll bite you and you'll die. But we're friends. So on the way down, just as the snake had envisioned, the smoke from the lodges, the people coming out. And the snake had told the boy to put his hand out and say, stop. And they said, put that snake down. You'll be bitten and die. He said, no. Grandfather gave me this snake as my vision. He told me I will be a great hunter, a great warrior one day. And then as he was putting the snake down, he remembered the snake told him to pet him, 
as he put him on the ground. So he lays the snake down and pets him. Gets him every time. The snake bit the boy. The boy's laying there knowing that his time is coming. The time for him to take his final journey. The boy was upset. You bit me. And you told me you wouldn't bite me. The snake replied, I told you that at the mountaintop. We're in the valley now. And the boy dies. I tell this to children because every one of those children and every one of us at one point in our life has had a snake. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, making decisions that you should not, never make. And so I tell them, my father had a pet snake, two of them, alcohol and tobacco. He died when he was 51. My sister had a beautiful snake, and it was called Ra Raleigh Cigarettes. And she died at 70 with COPD and all the complications that go with it. So I tell the children, there are many snakes to play with that are not dangerous. But if you find the dangerous ones, leave them alone. And I tell them, you're going to be exposed to all of these things as you grow up. So be careful of what you pick. And then, oh good, time for one more story. This one is one of my favorites. It's called the wooden bowl. There was a grandfather father and son. They would eat at the table with their families. The children had to sit at the child's table and they were given wooden bowls because wooden bowls aren't going to break. And the children that were young enough and so they would drool, they'd make a mess on the floor. And one day, grandfather was told by his son that you're dribbling, you're messing up, you're breaking plates. I'm going to give you this wooden bowl. That wooden bowl signifies he now sits at the children's table. He didn't like it too well. The grandchildren loved it because grandfather would sit and share stories. They would ask questions about what life was like when they were his age. And he would tell stories about why the, why the coyote is dark, why the bluebird is blue, why the moon moves and shades. And then that went on for a couple months. And then one day, the grandson was out and he was carving. And his back was against his father. And he was carving and the father said, boy, turn around. What you carving? And he shows him the bowl. I'm making a wooden bowl, grandfather, or father. I said, wow, your, your grandfather will really love this. He could always use another bowl. And the boy looked confused. I said, grandfather, no. One day you will become old. You will dribble your food. You will break things. I'm preparing this for when I set you at the children's table. Guess where grandfather was the very next day? Back at the adult table. I share this with children because at the age they are, they have no knowledge that you were once their age, that you climbed trees, you swam in pools and rivers, and you were outside doing things that children do. As a grandchild gets older, they see less and less use for their grandparents. My grandchildren are from 15 down to 5. And as they grow, their attitudes change. And a lot of times those people have a gift. They're the elders for a reason. They have a story to tell. However, the problem is they don't want to push themselves on their grandchildren. They're waiting for the grandchild to ask them a question. So I tell them, when you go home, if you see your grandparents, next time you do, Sit down and talk to them and ask them this one question. And I guarantee their eyes will light up and they will smile. Say, grandfather, grandmother, share a story about what life was like when you were my age. So often we displace 
or forget the value of those that's moved before us and the knowledge that they share. But a lot of times they won't share it because nobody asks. So, the wooden bowl. All right. Um, the rest of this, it's about time. I've spoke for an hour. My, my, I was going to say my horse is getting a little voice. But uh, feel free. It's been an honor and a privilege to talk to you folks. And thank you again, John, for the invitation. However, before we go, we have a, an author among us today. Jeanette. Jeanette Jackson. She has a book that she sells here in the gift shop called Hunting Wildflowers. And I'm, oh, Mary's reading it? Would you care, would you care to give a short synopsis? Uh, here, we're going to give you a microphone. I have read the book as well, and if you like loving, mushy letters, you will love this book. <laughs> right, Mary? Got into it? Yeah? All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks, John. Thank you so very much, Jack. And thank you for joining us today, folks. Uh, feel free to come up and take a look at the, uh, the furs and artifacts that Jack has brought, and also tour the museum. And hopefully you'll join us next month. Take care.